Um, just welcome to everybody. Thanks for being here. I know um, Zoom fatigue is very real right now, so we appreciate um, you guys taking some time out of your day um, to attend our Industry Insights Careers and Law event. My name is Jen Fleming, and I'm the Career Advisor for Education, Nonprofit, and Government um, at the Career Center in DePaul. Um, and hosting this event with me is my colleague, Libby Woodard, who I'll let her introduce herself as well. Hi, everyone. I'm Libby. Um, I'm the Assistant Director of Employer Engagement and Internships for our career community. So I um, work with uh, employers that want to recruit students and then with Jen on events like these. Yeah, so again, we really appreciate you guys being here. Um, we have four panelists today um, that are going to take part in our panel discussion. Um, and they're all from a variety of backgrounds, which we're really excited about. Um, and you'll you'll learn a little bit more about their experience here in a second. Um, but everything from you know full time working um, attorney to law student to undergraduate student who's done an internship um, in the legal field, um, as well as a paralegal. So really, kind of all different aspects. Um, and experiences because we know that so many of you guys are interested in these different types of areas. Um, and so I will be facilitating the, the panel discussion today. Just a few really quick things if you can keep yourselves on mute um, until we leave time at the end for questions. Um, you can also drop a question in the chat, which Libby will um, kind of be uh, facilitating. So if a question comes up um, that feels really relevant at the moment, feel free to drop that in the chat and we can definitely um, go ahead and, and, and ask our panelists. Um, and then um, just camera usage, if you're able to have your camera on, um, I know when I'm you know, facilitating things or presenting, I always appreciate getting to see who I'm actually talking to. Um, if that's not possible, we completely understand and that's totally okay. Um, and then the last thing, um, we do have to do just a, a quick little poll at the end for our evaluation purposes. Um, so just make sure um, not to leave early so we can um, make sure to collect that information from you um, right at the end. So without further ado, I am gonna go ahead and um, have our panelists go ahead and introduce themselves. And um, Carly, why don't we go ahead and start with you. If you want to just share um, your name, your current position, and the organization or firm that you're with right now. Oh, hi, everyone. My name is Carly Mano. Um, I graduated from DePaul in 2019, and I'm currently a paralegal at Global Immigration Associates. It's an immigration uh, business law firm. And I'll pass it on to Lynette. Hi, everybody. My name is Lynette. I'm currently a junior here at the Paul, and I had an internship last year um, with Mil Mujeres, which is an immigration nonprofit. I'll pass it on to Anthony. Hi, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Anthony Backneck. I am a uh, civil rights litigator at the law firm of Kleinthorpe and Jenkins. Uh, I graduated from DePaul undergrad. Uh, it seems like I'm the elder statesman here back in uh, 2007. And I will pass, and I have very bad eyes, but I will pass it on to our last finalist uh, or uh, a speaker here. Hello, everyone. My name is Rivka Felina. I graduated from DePaul last year. Um, I majored in international studies, and I see Corbin here. Hi, Corbin. <laughs> she was the best uh, career advisor. Um, I'm a I'm going to be, I just completed my first year of law school at the University of Illinois College of Law, and I'll be a 2L next year. Awesome. So for our panelists, um, thank you for, for kind of giving us a little bit of that context. Um, if you can, share a little bit about your career journey from where you started to where you are now. Um, and I know this will look vastly different depending on where you're at, um, you know, if you're still in school, um, and, and how long you've been out, um, but, you know, degrees earned or degrees you're working towards, um, you know, maybe a brief history of previous related experiences um, that led to your current role. All right, so I'll start. Um, before I start, I want to say uh, Jen was so incredibly helpful when I did graduate college, because I know for undergrads, it's a really scary thing, you know, out in the real world, but Jen helped me with my resume and cover letter and she helped me land a job within honestly three weeks of graduating. Um, 
so I started off at a law firm called Fragman, um, and they're a global immigration law firm, but uh, the type of immigration is corporate. So it's work visas for mostly people who um, are from India and China and other countries. Um, and I, so the position I got there was assistant paralegal, it was kind of like a legal assistant. Um, it's a very um, entry level job and they teach you everything about immigration law um, and start you off on, with some work visas. And then um, I worked there for about a year and a quarter, um, a year and a couple months. And then in February, I got a new position at Global Immigration Associates, which is also in the same legal field, um, corporate immigration. And now I'm a paralegal and I'm learning more visa types. Um, and I really enjoy it so far. Did I answer the question? Okay. Cool. Yeah. And actually, Carly, can you just expand a little bit? I know, um, kind of just from my memory, you didn't have like what we would call like a ton of related experience on your resume yeah. um, when you were applying to these types of roles. But can you talk a little bit about the experience that you had and how you leveraged that um, to really talk about some of those transferable skills and how they would work? I remember you worked at, um, you know, at, a, at the vet office. Yeah. Um, can you just talk a little bit about that really quickly? Um, yeah, so um, I would say a bulk of my skills I got, it, academic skills I um, got from DePaul as a political science major, um, tons of reading and writing, because um, being a paralegal or an attorney, like you're just going to do a lot of reading and writing. Um, but in college, in high school, I was working at a vet as a vet tech and an animal care technician. Um, and so there's ways um, you can leverage the skills that you get from, you know, a job that might be completely mismatched to the one that you're applying to. Um, but if you can sell your skills in that, in that way. So, I don't know, it's been a while since I <laughs> applied, but I just remember, um, how did I, <laughs> I don't know, what did, I don't even remember what I wrote on my cover letter. Um, I just, I think that, I don't know, Jen, can you help me out here? <laughs> because- Yeah, I know, go ahead. I, it's hard to, to relate those two, um, but the bulk of it is, is like using your communication skills. Um, so yeah, so oftentimes as a vet tech, I was communicating with the vet, um, and communicating with clients and pet owners, um, saying, asking questions and helping them out and um, a lot of about being a paralegal is communicating with your attorney, you know, the higher up and asking, you know, like, what, what do you need me to do? When do you need me to do it? Uh, like, what's the deadline? Um, so there's those, what is that considered a hard skill or a soft skill, like communication? Um, communication is huge. Um, I don't know what else. <laughs> oh, that was perfect. Uh, you know, I think a lot of students come to me saying, well, I don't have any related experience. I haven't done a law internship because they can be hard to find as an undergraduate student. And so yeah. I think my point is just, you had some other experiences that maybe, you know, to somebody looking at a resume that you know didn't understand that employers really do look for these transferable skills of communication, you know, teamwork, things like that, time management, organization, where you're able to really meet deadlines and have a lot mm -hmm. of responsibility, um, you know, in order to take that to this next position, even if the position itself doesn't necessarily feel super related. Right, and um, at DePaul, I did take um, an immigration law class, so. Um, that also 
kind of piqued my interest. And if you can explain to wherever you're applying, whatever field of law it is, um, just your interest and your passion for it, um, they'd much rather take an applicant that wants to do it instead of someone that's just looking for a job, you know? Um, and also I'm interested in potentially attending law school in the future. So they, they like to see just that passion and the drive for the field you're going into. So I guess that's my spiel. Um, Lynette? Yeah, so I was a legal intern last summer and I liked the position enough where I stayed until December. And even though like it was unpaid, I was able to get um, the internship plus scholarship to cover some of the expenses because I was, you know, working the whole time. And there um, I was kind of working with the paralegal. So I would do, I would work on U visa applications. So U visas are visas that people that are undocumented here in the United States can apply for if they've been victims of crime. So I would help um, really uh, streamline those applications and worked on cover letters. And before that, uh, I worked, I was, I interned at an alderman's office and then I studied abroad in Northern Ireland for one summer. So I didn't have um, a lot of, yeah, related experience in the field. And I really learned a lot of what I needed to know um, on the job. And I think, you know, I was also a political science major. Um, I'm an applied diplomacy though major and um, minoring in Spanish. Um, and I'm fluent in Spanish. So I definitely think just reading, writing and knowing Spanish really helped me a lot in this internship. And like Carly said, like communication, I learned that through um, my internship as an alt with an alderman, just communicating with constituents and answering the phone and communicating with my supervisors. Um, I can pass it on to Anthony. Um, yeah, so I am, uh, like I said, I'm a civil rights attorney currently, a civil rights litigator. Uh, I was born and raised in Chicago, and I went to DePaul University uh, in undergrad. I graduated in 2007. Uh, I was an athlete at DePaul and then spent a year overseas in Rome, Italy as a professional athlete. Uh, I then went to law school at, at Michigan State University uh, and graduated in 2011. So I've been an attorney for approximately 10 years. And I have done a wide variety of litigation tasks. And what litigation means essentially is when a lawsuit is filed, uh, I'm the individual who will handle the lawsuit and, and try the case. And in that role, for the most part, I've done two substantial uh, things as a part of my um, career. And, and I'll back up for a second. And in undergrad, I did a substantial amount of internships because my goal at the time was to go to the FBI. So I... I I uh, worked at the FBI's office in Chicago. I worked at the Northern District of Illinois. I worked at Customs and Border Patrol. And my first um, uh, job out of um, undergrad uh, was actually for Interpol uh, in DC. So I did a little bit of that as well. Went to law school and I've done essentially two things since, since being an attorney. I won, uh, I represent police officers for the city of Chicago and for municipalities. Uh, throughout the Chicago land area and really throughout the state of Illinois and beyond uh, in civil rights litigation. And I also uh, spent a considerable amount of time. I was the head of special investigations for COPA, which is the Civilian Office of Police Accountability in Chicago. I spent three years as, uh, you know, kind of the number three or number four uh, at COPA, heading up their special investigations with respect to uh, large scale police shootings. Uh, corruption-esque issues with respect to law enforcement. And I have since left COPA and returned to private practice where I am again, a civil rights litigator. And now I do uh, substantially two things or maybe three things, which are really my career and life interests, which are one, I defend uh, what I would consider to be great officers uh, in civil rights litigation and beyond. I also, um, investigate officers and I fire, terminate, and prosecute officers. Uh, and I kind of pick and choose cases with respect to that. Uh, but I try cases and fire officers for unlawful uh, use of deadly force and corruption. And I also train officers extensively in the law and in use of force, 
uh, and other issues of that kind. So I kind of do all three uh, major issues that are that are currently on the forefront with respect to uh, law enforcement. And I will uh, pass it on to Rivka. Yeah, so um, with my kind of career or career in law journey, um, I kind of always knew I wanted to go to law school. Um, I'm, I'm passionate for social justice issues. And so that really, you know, guided me in um, my decision for wanting to do law school. However, you know, as I'm in law school right now, I kind of want to get the taste of like different, many different fields before I get to choose, you know, after post law school um, for what I specifically want to, you know, focus my practice or what I uh, do post law school. Um, but in my career journey, I felt that it was so important to gain experiences because one, I wanted things to have on my resume that because I'm the type of person that I'm not really great at standardized exams. And I know you guys are all students probably taking the LSAT now if you're thinking of law school. And I personally hate standardized exams. I'm not uh, the best at them by any means. And so um, I kind of want to shift the balance of my resume of having a lot of experiences so it can kind of outbalance like a bad LSAT score, even though that it's don't let that discourage you. Law schools take a holistic consideration of your application. But um, yeah, so I did um, an internship at CARE, the Council of American Islamic Relations, which is a civil rights firm in the city. They do a lot of great uh, work revolving around uh, racial discrimination and um, things of that nature. I also, uh, as I said, I was uh, I majored in international studies, so. Um, international politics and that all uh, amazed me and I really loved that area and so I did an internship with the Pakistani consulate which it wasn't really a law firm but you know do things that you're interested in because even though it's not related to law like it can still give you um, hard and soft skills that you'll need for law schools and you can always maneuver things or like frame things in a way where um, it can help for law school or um, and then I also um, interned at a local office in my community. It's called Khalaf and Abu Zair, which was an immigrations law firm um, where I got the opportunity to shadow lawyers and you know be in court, and which was a great experience. And so that's kind of what I would say if you're interested in going to law school to really get those experiences on your resume, just so that you can you know kind of know what law law lawyers are doing um, on the ground and what the real work is. Uh, but that's kind of just a small snippet of my journey. Yeah. And then um, we talked a little bit about skills, um, just given, you know, uh, Carly's background and how she was relating some of the, the skills she had. Um, so I'm going to move on just to the question around, you know, how do students um, prepare for a career or even, you know, say like a, a job coming right out of college? Um, in this industry, you know, what types of classes, what types of volunteer experiences um, or internships would you guys recommend just given um, your current experiences that you've had? All right, I'll start. Um, so as a, I, I think a lot of people, they typically major in political science if they're political science, international studies, um, some sort of major like that if you're interested in law, or um, I know a lot of people do English or philosophy or history. So those are kind of the main majors, but it's a, that's kind of a myth too. Like you don't need to have a specific major to go into the law, the legal field, which I think is really cool too. Um, sometimes STEM people end up as, as attorneys or paralegals. Um, but for me, the, the thing that prepared me the most definitely was the law and theory classes that I took, um, just because they're extremely writing intensive and like critical thinking, um, a lot of analysis. So from my experience as a paralegal, I would say if you don't enjoy writing and you don't enjoy research um, or analysis, then you probably should find a different field to go into. Um, but I also studied abroad with the DePaul Law School my senior year. Um, we studied human rights law in Costa Rica. And so I was actually in class with law students at DePaul and that was really cool. Um, that was an experience I had to 
interview with. Um, I had an interview with the professor to be accepted because it is a law school course. Um, but I would recommend, you know, studying abroad, seeing if you have those other opportunities because DePaul does do a few um, undergrad law school study abroad programs. Um, and it was only about a month. So um, see if you can fit those experiences into your curriculum still. Um, I highly recommend it. Um, and I, don't know, I think that's pretty much it. Yeah, what I have to say. What about you, Lynette? Yeah, something when I was applying for this internship that really helped me was I tutored at Erie Neighborhood House. I tutored immigrants. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that that experience like really showed that I was passionate about helping people. So even if like you can't get like a direct internship, um, I'd say like try volunteering with like the specific communities you want to serve. Um, and yeah, I agree with Carly. I definitely taking like political science classes and just like law and theory helped me. Um, but basically, like, I think any, like, writing course will really, like, help you if you're really that interested. So I can pass it on to Anthony. Yeah, I, I, uh, I, I take a, a slightly um, different approach. Uh, maybe it, it's uh, just based on a little bit of a, a significant experience. But I don't think that you need to focus on any particular degree or any particular class. Uh, you can, I, I, I've gone to law school and, and. Uh, tried cases who their undergrads were or biology and and engineering and and all sorts of all sorts of other things. It's really just a, a love and, and and passion for what you want to do, and that really depends on the person that you are and and what you're uh, considering uh, considering doing. Uh, for example, you don't have to go to the best law school in the country uh, if if your goals are to try cases and to be in front of a courtroom and to be in front of a jury. Uh, that's a completely different area of the law. It's a completely different style, uh, and it takes a it, it takes a completely different person. So it's really about to be not to be too corny, but about finding yourself, uh, which are these kind of years that I assume the majority of you are in. Um, about finding a you know, do I like being in front of people? Do I like arguing on paper? Uh, there's a place for everybody in the law, and uh, you just have to find uh, the right place for you. Uh, the, the thing I tell people the most who are entering this field or, or are thinking about entering this field, especially at your age, would be you got to work for free. And at, I, I, people look at me when I say that and they're like, they, they can't believe it. Um, but we all did it. We, you know, and I, I, obviously I'm older, but we all we all worked for free. I had probably six or seven different uh, internships, externships. They call them all different things at the time. I don't know if they still do. Um, but you work for free in a whole bunch of different fields as part of your schooling, uh, and you can bulk that as, on your resume as things that you've done and, and things that people are interested in. Everybody takes the, the majority of the same classes. Everybody is involved in a lot of the same groups. Um, but if you can differentiate yourself by uh, experiences, well, and most of those experiences are working for free. You're not going to go work for uh, the FBI or the CBP or uh, an alderman's office for a significant amount of money. You're just, it's just not going to happen. Um, so you have to be willing to do that. And that just shows people that you're determined, that you're interested, that you care. Uh, and that's the kind of stuff that people want to see. Uh, there's only a few things that unfortunately differentiate ourselves. And one of them is an LSAT score. And one of them is your hard work and determination and interest. Uh, and and you, you should be on top of that. Yeah. And then what was, oh, go ahead. No, go for it. No, no, no. I want you, let's finish this thought and then I'll, I'm actually going to tie it into the next one. Yeah, I was just going to say how um, in regards to like a specific like uh, class that prepared me or I think I can't really pinpoint a specific thing that prepared me for law school because law school is just like, if you go to law school, you'll just see it's just a huge mess within itself that you're going to have to figure out on your own and everyone needs to figure out what their way is specifically their study technique and their what works for them um i wouldn't say like a specific class geared me for anything um of course international studies helped me with analysis critical thinking and research and writing and um but again a lot of things you're going to learn on your feet in law school and you're going to have to learn them on the spot 
but I do think it's important just to develop good study habits and making sure that you know how to schedule very well and knowing how to juggle things. I think that's what's more important because I don't know if, I don't think there's just this one class that's just gonna prepare you for law school. And this kind of goes into like, people kind of ask me if they should take this one week course at Duke University if, that prepares them for things. And maybe it will help, but I think at the end of the day, I think, um, you really are going to be able to know yourself and what helps you best when you get to law school and, you know, just making sure you develop good study habits and techniques. And then we had a question in the chat from Juliana. Um, are there any programs or clubs you would recommend for students to become involved in or pre-law programs we could apply for outside from DePaul? So I did this program called Legal Trek. I'll put the link in the chat. Um, but it was basically this program for um, under, I think it did, you didn't even have to be an undergraduate, but if you were a first generation student, um, then you qualify for this program. And um, we had like a variety of different activities that specifically talked about law school. And then um, this was like a summer long program. We would meet, I wanna say once or twice a week for like two, three hours and it was all online. It was really helpful for me just to get an idea of like what law school was, whether it was something for me. And then I also um, got affordable LSAT prep out of that program. So I would definitely say, I think the applications closed a couple of weeks ago for this year, but just keep it in mind for next year for following application cycles. That's a great resource. Thank you, Lynette. Um, and then for the next question for our panelists, what is the most rewarding aspect of your role and then also the most challenging? Uh, so the type of law that I do um, is corporate immigration. So that's different from asylum based. Um, so basically giant companies typically and smaller ones too they find foreign workers um, from outside the u.s who have bachelor's degrees master's degrees and some have phds um, either foreign or domestic degrees and we um we apply for their work visas so a lot of the stuff that we do is non-immigrant, but um, if the company likes them enough, they'll sponsor them for an immigrant visa. Um, and so we work on green cards and the green card application process um, can take up to 20, 25 years, um, depending on what country you're from, because there's a visa bulletin that has quotas for each country. Um, so, the most rewarding part I would say is when someone finally gets their green card and their permanent residence and they're, um, you know, they've worked so hard. And that is um, really special. And, and when the foreign, I apologize, my dog is barking. Uh, and when the foreign nationals are grateful and like, we appreciate you so much. Thank you so much for helping. It feels really good. Um, the most challenging part, um, is the changing administration. Um, so when Trump was in office, there was, it was a more anti-immigrant administration and he did a lot of things. The administration did a lot of things to uh, try to, uh, there were travel bans. So we had foreign nationals stuck in other countries, um, unable to work, um, just a, a whole, bunch of things, but now that the administration has changed, it's it's loosened up. But the most challenging part is not knowing what's gonna be shaken up next. Um, and sometimes the visa bulletin will make a bunch of people current for filing their green cards. And we had a huge push in October where I did, um, I was working really long late nights. so. As a paralegal and an attorney, um, sometimes depending on what area of law you're in, you'll you'll be working a lot of overtime. Um, but that's just kind of the nature of the legal field; it, it changes with the laws. So, I'll pass it on to Lynette. 
Yeah, I definitely agree with Carly. Like one of the most rewarding. I actually, I haven't because U visas, like the process can take over like five years. So I never actually like got to see somebody that I worked on a case for, like actually get it approved. But I think it's definitely rewarding for me working at an immigration nonprofit, knowing that like somebody wouldn't have been able to like afford this from like a fancy immigration attorney. So then they came to us. So definitely helping people that like, otherwise wouldn't have had the help, I think is a very rewarding experience. Um, but challenging, yeah, sometimes depending, I mean, for me, like I was given like internship tasks for like the whole week and it was kind of overwhelming at first, but I think, you know, as long as you take it one step at a time and you set your boundaries, I think that that's a good step to sort of overcome that. But yeah, I think it can definitely be challenging just to like think of the amount of work that sometimes you're assigned or have to do by certain deadlines as long as you stay on top of it, I think everything should be fine. And I'm going to pass it on to Anthony. Yeah, so so the, the most rewarding part uh, of, of my career, I believe, um, is just the substantial nature of what we're involved in and uh, the importance of reform in, in policing and as importantly, uh, defending uh, some of the, the greatest people you'll know uh, and it, it's, it's an overwhelming job, especially if at times you're on both sides uh, or can be depending on the set of facts and the circumstances, but uh, to be involved in something that uh, is on the front page of the paper every day uh, is, is overwhelming and, and humbling at the same time. And it's, uh, it's, a great, it's a great thing to wake up to every day and, and be a part of. Uh, the hardest part is always, it's it's going to be the hardest part, and there's no way to sugarcoat this uh, for anybody, but anybody should know it if they're going to go into the field of law. Um, you just, you're going to work a lot, and you're going to be very, very busy, and you're going to be overwhelmed. You're going to uh, struggle. We have first years and second years and third years um, who are exhausted, and they're tired, and they're overworked, and they're overwhelmed, and it takes a long time to, uh, people people do this job. Uh, for 40 or 50 years. And, and to think that you're going to know it in your first three or five is very, very difficult. And unfortunately, law school is not a good prep for the actual practice of law. It's, it's a theory-based education, um, as opposed to getting in front of a courtroom and uh, learning how to create pleadings and learning how to create interrogatories and requests and learning how to take depositions and things of that nature. It's just not the skills that you learn in law school uh, I think they're starting to move towards that, but not uh, quickly enough. So uh, it's just going to be, the hardest part is always going to be a, a feeling of being overwhelmed, um, but the, the benefits outweigh that. And then it looks like I missed a question from Jocelyn in the chat here. So my apologies, Jocelyn. Um, her question for everyone was, what made you want to pursue law? which I think is a good, a good question. Carly, do you, oh, yeah. Rivka, sorry. Sure. I, hold on, sorry. I, I totally <laughs> jumped the gun on that question and, and didn't allow Rivka the opportunity to answer that last one. My apologies, Rivka. Um, no, it's, it's okay, no worries. Um, I, I mean, to add on to what everyone was saying for the last um, last question, I think, I mean, law school is very challenging. Don't let that dissuade you. Everyone can do it, but it is very challenging. Again, this is coming from, I just finished it. So obviously after finals, you're feeling very overwhelmed and exhausted. Everyone feels that way, but um, yeah, it's very challenging in that, like, you're gonna have to, you have like one thing about that's known in law school is that professors will pick on you. You may not be ready, but you have to answer. It's not your choice. So they'll be like, Corbin, what is the answer to this question? And you have to be ready at all times and you have to have your camera on at all times. And so it's been challenging a year, especially with COVID. Everyone knows this. You guys have dealt with COVID during the semesters too. And so it's just like kind of awful in that respect too. That's been challenging. But um, I, I hope, one thing that I hope to use my law degree for is to help marginalized communities. And so Hopefully this summer I'll be working with Ascend Justice, which is um, a law firm, uh, a public interest law firm dedicated to helping domestic violence survivors. And so 
um, and victims of domestic violence. And so that's what I hope to be, um, you know, I can use my skills that I've been learning in law school and uh, for that purpose. And so that's kind of what I hope. The course also what's important is the content that you learn in class and what you're learning in class is just so interesting. I'm sorry if I'm breaking up by the way, my Wi-Fi is kind of, my Wi-Fi is shaky, but yeah. Um, but yeah, that's, that's basically. Great. Right. So then um, if we want to come back to Jocelyn's question, um, her original question, just of, you know, what made you want to pursue law in the first place? Um, Carly, maybe we'll have you start with that one. Yeah. Um, it's, I, I look at law um, it, from a creative lens because um, I have a really artistic background. Um, but I think that law is interesting because it's crafting and formulating arguments. And so um, a lot of times it's just kind of convincing. It's like, if your argument is good enough, you can convince other people to believe it almost. Um, and it gets fun sometimes um, to, write things and I, I feel like I can put a lot of my creativity, my creative part of my brain into it. Um, but I, of course, I'm not in law school, I'm not an attorney uh, yet. So I feel like Rifka and Anthony could extrapolate more on that or I, I'm interested to see what they have to say. But I don't know, Lynette, if you wanna go ahead. Yeah, so for me, I think why I was interested in like law or like law or like in the, the legal field was because I really like, like Rifka, like I wanted to help marginalized communities and I was interested in immigration law because my parents are immigrants and I just grew up in a community where this was such a big issue and I really wanted to help people. Um, but yeah, I'm interested to hear Anthony and Rifka what they have to say. Yeah, absolutely, and and uh, I think at, at the at the at the heart of everything for me is the fact that you're going to have to do something for a long time in your life, and you really have to love it. You really have to enjoy it, and it really has to become a passion of yours. And law enforcement has always been a passion of mine. I always wanted to go into the FBI at the time. The the route, and this is the 2000s, obviously, the route to the FBI was in fact law school. Uh, it's not so much anymore. Uh, I, I got an opportunity to go to the FBI. I chose, I chose not to uh, because I loved my job as much as I do. And I love what I do and who I do it for. And I love being on uh, kind of on the, on the front end of, of reform in our, in our country, in our city and, and otherwise. So I think it's really about finding um, your passion and being a part of something. And, and, and you just can't let other things get in the way. I mean, uh, what I've heard a lot um, from the other panelists is uh, these are these are jobs and these are um, abilities that you're just not going to get paid um, six hundred thousand dollars a year. For. Um, but that that's not the only thing that matters in life. You have to you have to wake up every morning. You have to be very very happy with the thing that you're going to go and do um, every day for the next forty years, and that's that's really important. I was actually on the fence between law school and medical school, and one of the reasons that I, I also, you know, also went to, to law school is because uh, I could wake up tomorrow and say, I don't want to be a, I don't want to be a litigator in front of 12 people in a jury anymore. I want to go run a hospital. And being a lawyer is one of the only things that you could just turn and pivot. And all of a sudden you're doing a completely different thing in life. And you have the skills that, that uh, people need in order to lead other people uh, to get a, to get a job accomplished. So being a lawyer is just a, a, a really, really uh, impressive thing that, that is still uh, beyond what, what TV tells you, um, an important part of our society that, you know, if you, if you look around uh, people who are not practicing, I learned the other day that 50 to 60% of people uh, who have JDs don't practice. That, that doesn't mean that they're not using it. They're, they're, 
they're running businesses, they're running entities, they're running hospitals, they're running all sorts of things. And, and that's all based uh, on the law. And, and I saw a couple of questions. I just want to uh, address them really quickly because I'm, I'm, I, I don't want to um, assume, but I'm probably, uh, because of my age, the one who has children and, uh, you know, different, different types of family responsibilities. It is uh, very difficult. Uh, that, that's the bottom line. Uh, when you're a practicing an attorney and you have children and you have uh, responsibilities and, and a home and, and everything in between, uh, it can be very, very hard. Uh, but you just learn you just learn how to balance it. You learn how to uh, take control of your time. Uh, you make sure that you're at a firm or a job that uh, respects your time and your time management. Uh, and, and you just have to, you have to take control of your own life. And if it doesn't work uh, for you in that particular job, you have to move on because there is a most important thing and that is always going to be my, my wife and my children. Um, so it's, it, it can be done, but I will not tell you that it is at any point easy. Yeah, um, I can't speak to that question because I don't really, I mean, just as a student living with family, it is difficult in general, but having kids and a uh, spouse, and that's that's a whole other ball game I'm not familiar with. But um, in general, why I came to law school, um, I in general wanted that type of training where you know you look at your you're able to look at a document and read it like a lawyer. I always wanted to have that type of training because. Oh, sorry. Sorry, I received a phone call. Um, I always wanted to have that type of training because, you know, when a lawyer is looking at a document or a law, um, it's different than when a, doc a doctor, a dentist, you know, a lawyer can read it in a different way and be able to um, figure out the language and dissect the language in a different way. And I kind of wanted that skill um, in life in general. Um, and I think like loss, the law in general, we're impacted by it every single day um, without even realizing it. And so this is another reason why I wanted to. And of course, like I mentioned before, I'm really into social justice issues. Um, and I always wanted to use my uh, law degree in a way to help um, communities, uh, especially from where I'm from, uh, I'm Palestinian. And so I, there's, I thought I wanted to do immigration law, but um, kind of, I don't want to restrict myself. Like Anthony said, lawyers are seen in everywhere are seen everywhere and they could do everything. And so I kind of came into law school thinking, you know, I'm not going to limit myself. I want to try to taste everything before I kind of um, see where um, I want to continue with. Yeah. And then we have a, a few um, comments and kind of questions in the chat just regarding kind of like that, uh, you know, personal life versus work life balance um, that Anthony started hitting on. Um, and just for our other panelists, um, you know, obviously, uh, you know, law school student, paralegal, intern, um, you know, looks a little bit different than that, you know, full time um, practicing attorney, maybe, but still, obviously, a lot of time management that has to go into that. Um, you know, Carly, you mentioned having to work overtime and long hours. Um, so I guess, you know, just to kind of summarize the questions that are in the chat regarding this, um, if you can just, you know, Talk to us a little bit about how you're able to navigate that work-life um, balance. Yeah, um, I, after a year and a half, almost two years of being a paralegal, um, I think I finally figured it out. Um, of course, I don't work as much as attorneys do, but uh, most weeks I'm clocking 45 to 50 hours and that's kind of normal. And so you kind of have, you have to get used to it. Um, but the way I balance my time is I found a passion for yoga. Uh, you should have hobbies, um, things that keep you grounded, things in meditating, journaling. I also, um, after work, I will just sit down and draw or paint. Um, play with my dog. That's the best way I can tell you how to balance your time. I also um, highly recommend just having a calendar app. Like it, it helps with scheduling things. Um, and the transition to work from home, because right now I'm a hundred percent remote, 
it was challenging at first, but I've learned to love it because um, I can message my attorneys and say, hey, I have a doctor's appointment, you know, at 10 a.m. I'll be offline for an hour, but you can just clock back in later um, and work later. And some, some days you do have to work on a Saturday or a Sunday. That's the nature of it because, um, you know, as much as paralegals or as much as attorneys work, um, there's a whole team of paralegals underneath them working on a bunch of different things. So um, yeah, attorneys do often work weekends, I noticed, um, keep that in mind. But if you can find a hobby, something you love outside of it, it makes the job more enjoyable because you can look forward to doing that after work or before. So I'll move it on to Lynette. Um, so my internship was like fully remote. So what I would do is I would make sure that I was going on walks. Um, and I would just like try to like just turn off my computer uh, whenever I really wasn't doing any work and just like force myself to do other things. And I think that made like trying to separate my time out a lot better. Um, and also like something that I learned, it's like if you're like forcing yourself to do something like that's also like not really good. So just like trying to like find boundaries and, you know, like Carly said, find hobbies. Um, I think that helps. But I think from the intern's perspective, I was working like 30 hours a week. So I don't think that's like as overwhelming as like 50 hours. So it's definitely just trying to like accommodate or like get used to like what work you have in front of you and setting boundaries. What, um, oh, I'm going to pass it on to Anthony, sorry. <laughs> Okay, I'm sorry. What was the the, the question with respect to work life boundaries? Is that yeah, mostly just work life balance. And I know you touched on it. You kind of kicked us off touching on that. Just you know, noticing what was in the chat. Um, if you want to expand or leave it at that, totally up to you. Sure. So yeah, I, I think that you certainly need a significant work life balance to the extent um, that you can. Most firms are. You're just gonna. You're you're going to get into this if if you go to a firm. Uh, which is the majority of attorneys who are practicing practice at firms. And that is going to be based on a billable hour. Uh, and therefore, you're, you're working based on billable hours, and you're going to work a lot of billable hours, depending on what your particular uh, firm's uh, billable hour requirement is and, and, and things of that, uh, of that nature. It becomes so second nature uh, that you don't even think about it. Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll do work on Saturday and Sunday. Um, when my when my kids are sleeping or, or uh, when they're out of the house or something, it, you'll answer a phone call, you'll do things, but it becomes so second nature that you barely uh, even even consider it work. Uh, it's just ingrained in in, in necessarily um, what you're doing. And then with re with respect to some of the other questions that are in the chat, and I'm sorry if I uh, don't get to these, but anyone can um, always reach out to me at any point. Um, I I think. I think if you have the means to put yourself through law school to do something else, meaning you have a goal in life um, and you think law school is going to be a part of getting you there more quickly uh, and you have the, the means to do that, I, I would 100% uh, support that. I think that that's, uh, it, that that's an incredible thing to do. You just have to have the, the means and maybe you're a great uh, test taker or, or a great student and you got um, a substantial scholarship. Um, take advantage of it. Um, but I would, I would tell you on the, on the other end that, uh, if you're not sure that you're going to practice at all, uh, and there's another way to get to where you want to be, uh, without spending $250,000, um, you may want to consider it, uh, because most people walk out of law school with, uh, debt, uh, and it, it, it the, the career in itself pays for itself, but, uh, there's a lot of things to consider there. If you're, if your goal from day one is to never practice. Yeah, 100%. That's the first thing I thought about when I read that question too. It all depends on whether, you know, you have the means for it and whether it fits with your long-term long -term plans. Um, in regards to the work-life balance question, it's very interesting because from this last semester, we I had a class, it was basically the fundamentals of legal practice that I had. And, you know, we heard from many different attorneys or and business people who, you know, were kind of in the field and they we're speaking about what they expect from a lawyer and 
you know, we were kind of, and in that conversation of like work-life balance, we kind of realized that there was a disconnect between the generations of like what work-life balance means because, um, you know, in the higher generation, they, they believe like, you know, you have to work, 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 work. And like our generation were kind of like, you know, we, we should work, 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 but like, you know, there should be time for like, um, we should leave space for like our mental and emotional health. Like we shouldn't just be, you know, working for the dollar every single um, minute of our life. And so there's, there's this balance that you need to find. I think um, I haven't found it yet. I'm still looking for it. But um, one thing that I try to do is have maintain great relations and like spend time with my family and friends. That's kind of what keeps me sane throughout all this. Um, um, especially, especially during times of Corona. I don't know if this is going to lead to the fall. If it does, RIP me. Um, but I think what, especially during times of COVID, you need to really figure out, um, of course, but like group studying and getting much interaction with other students and like as much as you can um, and meeting other people through the internet. Um, and like, you know, what me and my friends have been doing is, okay, let's get on a Zoom call and let's just do work together. And so that's kind of been helping a lot too, um, especially since I've, a lot of people are feeling isolated during these times. Um, and so figuring out what works for you, going on walks, disconnecting, yeah, turning off your laptop a lot helps, but yes, especially since our bedrooms are now our offices and places of sleep and it's just the whole thing, but uh, yeah, that's basically it. Right. Um, and I think I'm just going to, you know, end with one more question for our panelists and then we'll open it up uh, to the audience. Um, I do just want to say, you know, I noticed in everyone's kind of answer around that work life balance is that it takes time to figure it out, right? It's not something that you're able to figure out a lot of times in that first six months. It, you know, takes process and elimination and things like that. So really knowing that it's a process to figure out what's going to work for you. Um, so last question, um, where do you see your career going in the next five years? Um, so, you know, whether it's considering attending law school or, um, you know, pivoting to a different type of law, um, talk to us a little bit about kind of where you see your trajectory going. Yeah, so I feel like um, the pandemic, uh, made me reevaluate a lot of things. Um, I was so fortunate to keep my job, um, actually transition to a new law firm um, and progress in my career. But I know that wasn't the same for a lot of people. A lot of people are starting from square one or they've been knocked down and they're just getting back up on their feet. Um, but it, for a while I've been like, yes, I'm going to law school. Yes, I'm going to law school. Um, but I think that kind of has been put on hold for a minute and I'm still trying to evaluate what's best for me. And um, after being a paralegal um, for a little bit of time now, I've seen the way attorneys are stressed out um, and how much they work. And I'm not sure if that you know, aligns with my values anymore and the things that I want. So the truth is in five years, I may be attending law school or I might just continue and be a paralegal because the truth is paralegals can make very good money, um, you know, towards mid late career. I'm already making more than I thought I would ever be two years out of college. Um, and so, and I feel like I've found this work-life balance that we were just talking about where I'm pretty happy with myself even while working 45, 50 hours a week. Um, so that's where I see myself, either progressing to a more senior paralegal position or taking the LSAT and going to law school. I'll pass it on to Lynette. Um, so I actually tried studying for the LSAT. Um, I think I started in March. And then I kind of realized in April that I just wasn't like ready for it mentally and like that was okay. So I think for me, what I want to do is I just want to explore things a lot more. And I'm not like, I'm definitely interested in immigration law, but I also want to see like different like fields of law and like get more work experience and like realize if law school really is something that I want to do 
um, because it is a substantial financial and you know, a really big time commitment. So I want to be 100% sure that this is what I want to do if I do want to you know, keep on studying for the LSAT. I would say like if you really are interested in studying the LSAT for right now while you're in like undergrad, like something that I didn't do is I didn't take that diagnostic test like right away. I took it when my prep course like was about to start. And then when I, you know, took that diagnostics test, you know, um, I was kind of scared to take it. Like, I didn't want to see the results. Um, and I kind of realized that I was going, after I took it, like, if I wanted that certain score, I was going to have to work really, really hard. So I would say, like, if you're interested in, like, taking the LSAT, like, take that diagnostics test and see, like, how hard you're going to have to work. Um, so, in, like, the next five years, I really don't know where I'm going to be. And I think I just have to be, like, okay with that. Um, I'm doing like a summer research program at UIC um, this summer that I got it because I'm also like a McNair scholar. Um, so I think I'm just kind of like in a state of like explore, exploring things and seeing like what I like and what I don't like. And I think for me, the challenge is just being okay with that and not knowing exactly what I want to do. Yeah, I'll send you the diagnostics link. I think you could take a bunch of free tests. Um, but yeah, I'll pass it on to Anthony. Sure, thank you. Um, I, you know, I'm not, I am not uh, one for um, predictions, I should say, uh, or long-term plans. Uh, it's kind of where I break um, from my generation, my, my generation, and I fit more aligned with uh, some younger ones. Uh, I, I'm really a follow uh, your heart kind of guy. And, and when I, whenever I have been tired of something, or, and, and I don't mean on day one, uh, but ever, anytime that I've ever been, you know, this isn't for me anymore, or I'm not excited about it. Um, if I don't get in front of a jury and get nervous, uh, then I'm going to move on um, and, and try something new and pivot to something new. Um, because that, that, that sort of passion and emotion and, and, and positive energy, uh, positive nervousness is, is what makes uh, for me tick. And, and, and I've already been, I'm not uh, a long-term, uh, or I haven't been in the, in the past, I should say, a long-term firm guy. I was at one firm for six years, um, you know, made partner and left. And a lot of people's life goal was to make partner. And it's just, it's not really for everybody. Uh, you just have to decide what is for you and, and, and keep uh, moving. So um, it's, it's, for me, it's about passion. And if I feel like I'm not passionate about something, uh, I'll move on. Uh, considering where I am and how much I like it, I would I would uh, venture to think that I'll either be in a position like I am now or in another um, high level position in the government uh, working on some of the same issues. Yeah, I think for me, just like everyone else has stated, um, I like I said many times before, uh, I'm, I'm, well, I want to explore many different fields before I land on one thing. But um, yeah, I think what I want to try to do is and being more open to reaching out to things that you're interested to organizations that you're interested in and seeing and looking at who works there and sending cold emails that says, hey, my name is this and I'm interested. I really enjoy I really like the work you do. Do you want to have a conversation? Because that's also a part of like networking. I hate that word, guys, but you're going to hear it for the rest of your life, unfortunately. But yeah, um, I need uh, working on networking is something that I hope to do. Um, and I, in terms of like resources, I know this question wasn't hit on, but I feel like it's important. Um, I know a lot of the law school prep costs a lot of money, and I, and I just wanted to send a link for something that helped me because Lynette was kind of talking about that. It's, I used, it's called lawschoolie.com and it gave, I used the Bible books. I think if you buy the Bible books, I self-studied, um, you should be fine, hopefully. And it gave like um, a really good um, schedule of what you should be doing and what types of questions you should be drilling and like when you should take practice exams. And so that's what helped me. I'll put the website link. Um, I didn't buy the their actual prep materials all I just buy the bought the schedule and so you could prep with but um that's something that helped me um and if anyone has any questions about um the law school application process or anything in general feel free to shoot me an email at all yeah and we appreciate you um I know noticed that you put your contact information so definitely appreciate 
um, that. I know a lot of students have questions around the law school application process. Um, so I am noticing the time and um, I do wanna be really mindful of our panelists time, um, just given that it is a work day and they kind of gave up um, probably was it what wasn't even really their lunch. Um, and so, um, you know, hopefully people were able to put in questions within the chat throughout. Um, but I am going to go ahead and wrap up today's event, um, just to be respectful of our panelists' time. I mean, really great insight, um, you know, loved hearing about these experiences and really appreciate the, the specific resources, too, um, that we will make sure to pass on um, to students. And so um, Libby's going to launch a, a quick poll here for our students. Um, but if we can just give a, a quick round of applause to um, all of our panelists for their time and expertise um, and insights today. Um, and then you, as long as you are RSVP'd on Handshake, you will receive a recording um, of the event um, in a follow-up email. It does have to go through our communications team, so it could be up to a week until you receive that. So just a heads up on that timeline. Um, but thank you everyone for, for being uh, with us today. And thank you, especially to our panelists. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah.